Welcome to Spiritual Psychology. My name is Renee Lavalle McKenna, and I bring my 30 plus years as a recovering addict and ex crazy person turned therapist and shamanic healer to bring you snackable teachings on spirituality, psychology, and all things personal growth. And today I want to talk about guilt and that there are two kinds of guilt there's appropriate guilt and there's unearned guilt. And guilt is a really powerful feeling tied to deeper beliefs, values, and thought patterns. And like a lot of difficult or uncomfortable feelings, guilt is usually so uncomfortable, we just do whatever we're habitually used to doing to get away from the feeling. At least that's what I always did. And the thing about feelings is that they hold tremendous information. And if we don't take the time to be consciously and deeply present with our feelings, We often don't get the deeper information that they hold. And this isn't always easy being present with our feelings in a conscious way, particularly the difficult or painful ones. And it may seem much easier to just medicate, distract away, or behave in whatever patterned way we use to manage those difficult feelings. But looking deeply at our guilt is really important, especially if we're on any kind of path of personal growth or recovery. And clarifying, learning the difference, or at least to recognize the difference between these two kinds of guilt that we might call appropriate guilt or inappropriate guilt, earned guilt or unearned guilt, clarifying, separating, getting clear about what the guilt is really rooted in, gives us that valuable information that we need in how to make conscious choices about how we're going to respond or react in our life. And guilt is very tied to responsibility, response ability, our ability to respond. And frequently with guilt, we're caught in patterns of unconscious responses. And when we get conscious about our responses and do them from a place of decision rather than unconscious habit, this allows us to come from a place of empowerment, maturity, and grounded conscious actions that we're deciding to take rather than just unconsciously acting out these old patterns that no longer serve us. And so what's the difference between these two kinds of guilt, earned and unearned, or appropriate guilt and inappropriate guilt? And so appropriate guilt is pretty straightforward. It's when we do something wrong and we know it. Appropriate guilt is our own internal conscience meter, lets us know when we're acting outside of our own integrity. And the more conscious and emotionally mature we become, the clearer and less confusing our inner conscience and guilt meter become. And our reaction to appropriate guilt shows us also where we are in our own self-development and our relationship with pride or fear and humility or faith. And the cleanest, clearest, and simplest way to resolve that earned guilt is to make direct amends to the person, place, institution, or circumstance where I behaved badly, to assess what I did wrong, and to own it and make reparations directly to wherever the harm was perpetrated. And I've played with this a lot in my life. (laughs) So for example, I used to be a thief. I was a thief for a really long time, and I was a pretty good thief. I rarely got caught. I stole clothes, jewelry, food, shoes, and I actually had quite a lot of pride in my shoplifting abilities. I did get caught once when I was a teenager, and I threw on my most innocent face as the police brought me home in a police car and swore that it was the first time I had ever done it. I might have even squeezed a couple tears out, and I was completely full of shit. (laughs) I was already a practiced thief by that point started stealing when I was nine years old, candy bars and cigarettes from the local store. And I could talk at length about the deeper psychology around theft and stealing, and that it's rooted in feeling undeserving and believing that the universe will not give us what we really need. We need to steal it. But that's another podcast. And I had a lot of justifications around my shoplifting and theft and my own inner moral code. And this is one of the important things about getting really conscious about our earned guilt is that it gives us information and the opportunity to really get clear about our own values, what's important and unimportant to us. 
And from my perspective, there's really no right or wrong in that. We get to determine our own moral code. I mean, we do it anyway. It may certainly be informed by external moral codes of our family, our culture, our religion. But we'll talk about that more when we talk about unearned guilt. So I generally didn't steal directly from people. I stole from businesses, corporations, and stores. And it was very easy to justify that CVS or Walgreens, Target or Macy's wouldn't even miss these items that I was taking on a regular basis. So I never really felt bad about it. In fact, I didn't feel bad about it at all. In my own moral code, I was a have-not, and they were the haves, and I was my own little Robin Hood, stealing from the rich and giving to the poor, which was me. Now, there's an intrinsic downside in that worldview, which is that it keeps me in a poverty mindset. And again, one of the values of looking deeply within ourself is the opportunity to expand and evolve our worldview. But when I got clean and sober and started on my own personal growth path, I couldn't steal with impunity anymore. Disappointing as it was, I actually felt guilty when I stole the $6 lipstick from the drugstore. $6? Are you fucking kidding me? (laughs) I only wanted to pay them two, but I didn't set the prices. I probably only stole the lipstick a couple times before I realized, oh, might have even just been once. It felt bad, and the bad feeling was not worth the six bucks. (laughs) Probably cost me more than that in therapy to manage the bad feeling of appropriate guilt because my morals were evolving. The same thing happened when I would receive extra change at the cash register. I was at the grocery store and I saw them count me out an extra 10. This was the 1900s in the days of cash. (laughs) Now it's not an issue because I never carry cash. Everything's electronic. But anyway, the girl counted me out an extra 10 and I saw it happen and I thought, score. And I walked out of the store feeling richer for my $10 and this girl's mistake. And my first justification was, well, that's her mistake and it's my benefit. But then as the afternoon went on, That $10 started to get heavier and heavier. And I knew somewhere that this innocent mistake of this poor clerk who's probably working for minimum wage is that they were going to get in trouble. And I could say, oh, it's not my problem. It was their mistake. Yeah, but I saw it happen. I was consciously aware. And there was actually a little bit of stealing in that. And on the ultimate level, there are no secrets in the universe. Everything is recorded. We don't get away with anything which is such a bummer if you're a liar, a cheat, and a thief, like I was, (laughs) always hoping to get away with something. But I have clearly come to experience that the easier, softer way is to live a life of integrity. And it's much more beneficial. Pulls me out of poverty mindset. Calls me to worthiness, value, courage, and hope. So again, like the $6 lipstick, I went back a few days later and gave him back the $10. I don't know if the girl got in trouble, but that $10 bill became like a bad dog following me down the street, and I wanted to kick that puppy to the curb. (laughs) And returning that $10, making those direct amends, was actually food for my soul and my own self-development. And one of the really profound processes that is laid out in the 12 steps is in steps eight and nine. In step eight, we make a list of all the persons we have harmed and become willing to make amends to them. And in step nine, we go out and make those direct amends wherever possible, unless it's going to cause more harm to other people. Not if it's going to harm ourselves, if it's going to harm other people. And although you can go to a priest and confess your sins, you can go to temple on the Day of Atonement, making direct amends where we have done harm is one of the most profoundly transformative practices that I have experienced. And the best way to do it is face-to-face, emails and texts, unless the person won't see you in person. It's just not as powerful. And when we honestly and humbly own what we have done wrong, it clears the karma. And it can actually be transformative for the other person as well, because it's an unusual exchange that most people have never experienced. And I have more than once had the opportunity to make amends to another person for harms I've done to them. And it's really healing and transformative for them as well. 
just to be in that resonance of honesty and grace. I don't ask for forgiveness. I'm just being honest and shining the light on my own shadow. And then it's not shadow anymore. And it actually becomes a source of strength because from a spiritual standpoint, courage and self-responsibility turn humiliation into humility, turn avoidance into grounded presence and courage, and turn lack into gain. It's a character-building experience. And once character is built, no one can take it away from us. And as I grow in character, I grow in my strength and fortitude as a person. My experience of the grace of God and universal flow is more present in my awareness. And I move out of that poverty mindset. And that imposter syndrome that I lived with and the deeper ideas that if you really knew who I was, you wouldn't like me, fall away because I no longer have anything to hide. And when people love, care for me, respect me, they're loving, caring for, and respecting the real me, not some fake facade that I'm putting out so I can hide my bad behavior. So appropriate guilt is tied to our own value system and sense of integrity. And when we go outside of it, we feel bad. And it's about our relationship with ourself. And of all the relationships in my life, my relationship with myself is primary because everything I do, everywhere I go, there I am. And we don't get to have it both ways on the deeper level. I can't be secretly out of integrity and hope to get the benefits of integrity because, again, there are no secrets in the universe. And I don't know if there's a day of reckoning after our death, but the quality of people's death and dying process is often very clearly tied to their integrity in their life. And I know people who have cleaned it up on their deathbed. Dear friend's nephew was dying of brain cancer in his early 30s, and he'd struggled a lot with addiction and mental illness. He'd been really abusive and neglectful, been in and out of prison, and he had a couple of kids with different women that he didn't show up for as a father. And as his disease progressed and it became clear that he was not going to survive, he had the opportunity to make amends to the mother of his six-year-old daughter and to that girl. He was able to acknowledge and own his destructive behavior in the family with different family members. It was quite profound and beautiful. My sense is that he was not able to fully forgive himself, but he'll get to work that out in future lifetimes, I guess. But from my perspective, he pulled it out of the toilet as best he could in this one, and it was really beautiful to see. And he died with loving people around him rather than in a two-bit hotel, alone face down with a needle in his arm. He had a good death. We should all aim for that. And owning our appropriate guilt can be an important part of that process. So now about unearned guilt, inappropriate guilt. And this is guilt that's externally imposed from the larger system or structures that we're a part of. The unwritten codes, relational agreements, the family expectations that are never spoken, the cultural or religious taboos that are part of institutions that we were born into. And if those external value structures align with our internal value structures, that's fine. Then those things become a part of our appropriate guilt. But if those external structures don't align with our own internal authentic value systems, then we have a misalignment of integrity, and it can cause a lot of inner conflict. And because this inappropriate or unconscious guilt is part of a habit or a pattern, we often don't really even understand what's happening or feel like we have the power to change it. And this is where getting conscious about our feelings and separating appropriate from inappropriate guilt is really, really helpful and powerful. And it might be important to notice that what I'm calling unconscious guilt is actually part of our limbic brain, I think. Humans are social creatures, and at a time early in our evolution, tribal or village or clan culture was completely tied to our survival. And we needed to operate as a unit, as a group, in order for the well-being of everyone to be taken care of. If everybody was off doing their own thing, there might not be enough food, shelter, warmth, water to be able to sustain the population. And one of our innate functions as social beings is that we energetically or emotionally or behaviorally attune to other people. Like the idea that water seeks its own level, 
energetically, we naturally want to attune with other people so that we're all kind of on the same page. Makes things easier and more comfortable. And one of the ways to understand unearned or unconscious guilt is that it's a signal in our body that we're acting outside of the group expectations. And those group expectations can be really strong and powerful, even though they're usually unspoken, although they certainly may be codified as laws, taboos, and even directly expressed expectations. A lot of times they're not. If you've been going to mother's house for Christmas for the last 20 years, and you've come to hate it, and you don't want to go, but you feel guilty for not wanting to go, that's inappropriate guilt. That the family, or even just mother herself, their external expectations may not align with your own inner integrity, especially if those relationships are dysfunctional. And stepping outside or going against the tribal family, religious, or clan culture can be really uncomfortable in our bodies. And it may upset other people because, again, this more tribal structure is about safety, expectations, obligation to the group. It's not about individual development at all. It's about your responsibility to tribal survival or to make sure mom doesn't have an uncomfortable feeling. I have a client who's making tremendous positive change in her life and decided to stop drinking and has begun a really powerful path of self-transformation. It's beautiful and very inspiring. They had to go to a work conference. And there were a couple of big drinking events. Normally, they would be participating. And they did fine not drinking at the events, but when they went back to the hotel room, they had this weird guilt. And it's because they were stepping out of the social norm that everybody was getting all sloppy and drunk. And a lot of people don't like it when you start to evolve because it points to their own devolution. And it's extreme misery loves company. And as we start to evolve and resonate up the consciousness scale, it becomes really obvious the dissonance of people stuck in dysfunction. They can even feel attacked by that because their low development becomes obvious as we start to emanate more light, cast more shadow. Now, in an optimal circumstance, and I have seen this in families, when one person begins to do their self-growth work, others are inspired by it, and it heals and evolves the whole system. Over and over, I have seen a wife get sober, and then the husband gets sober, and then the kids get into therapy, and even grandma starts doing better, goes to Al-Anon, stops taking Valium all the time. And then there's other circumstances, and this was my experience, where one person gets better and the family can't handle it. They are not interested in looking at themselves, and they reject or eject the person out of the system. And the kind of middle path, which is probably the most common, is that one person will grow and develop, and then the whole system will kind of recalibrate itself to adjust to that. But unearned guilt is guilt when we haven't done anything wrong. It's inappropriate guilt when it calls us to act outside of our own integrity to adhere to these external structures, codes, rules, expectations that don't align with our own value system. This is an extremely common experience in the LGBTQ population, where the family cultural religious expectations or even obligations or religious law at its most extreme rejects any kind of sexual or gender variation at all. Johnny can't have a boyfriend. And Susie better dress like a girl. And if you don't do that, terrible things are going to happen. God gets all fucked up, apparently, which is not true. In fact, there's plenty of gay animals in nature. In fact, there's a beautiful children's book. And Tango Makes Three, it's a children's book about two male penguins from the Central Park Zoo in New York. And the zookeepers give them an egg that they help hatch and raise to be a healthy part of the penguin colony. And life is complicated, so we have to make our own decisions of whether we are living from our own integrity or deferring to cultural, family, or religious norms. And it's often not an either-or. And this is where getting really conscious about appropriate guilt and inappropriate guilt can help us make the complex decisions of how to navigate our life circumstances in a way that feel honest, grounded, and in integrity for us. And I don't think there's any right or wrong in that, 
But when we're aware of what's happening, gathering the information, then we can make decisions from a mature, grounded, and empowered place. And we can experiment and change our mind. I have a client who's a lesbian and her parents were actually very accepting of that, but they were really afraid that grandma and grandpa couldn't handle it. And so for a few years, she wasn't allowed to bring her partner to Christmas dinner. And that started to really feel out of integrity for her because her brother got to bring his wife. Why couldn't she bring her wife? And so behind her mother's back, because mom was really trying to protect grandma from the horrors of homosexuality, apparently, she went and talked to grandma and said, so, you know, I'm in love with the woman. And she said, that's great, honey. What's her name? (laughs) And then the problem was actually breaking that to mom, who was apparently deeply entrenched in some unwritten code that didn't even really exist anymore, which is another reason why bringing our own integrity into these social, familial, cultural, religious contexts can be really helpful because we're all connected and our own evolution can help to evolve those systems that may just be unconsciously acting out behaviors that don't even fit for them anymore. And her now wife comes to all of the family functions and it's as normal, in fact, even healthier than her brother's relationship with his wife. So I encourage you to take some time and examine your guilt. Is it earned and appropriate? Have I behaved badly or outside of my own moral expectations? And my conscience is letting me know I better make this right. And I do encourage you to make it right, not just notice it. Or is my guilt unearned, passed down through generations? or written in some book somewhere that doesn't feel like it applies to me. And then we get to decide to consciously choose how we'll behave rather than acting out unconscious patterns that keep us stuck. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to do some free workshops with me, I'm on Insight Timer every week. There's a link in the show notes. You can get a free download of the first chapters of my book, Allies and Demons, Working with Spirit for Power and Healing, also in the show notes. And if you're interested to find out how spiritual psychology work might benefit you in your life or learn more about my year-long mentorship program, shoot me an email, info at ReneeMcKenna.com. I am still offering free one-on-one sessions in exchange for being recorded for my upcoming YouTube channel. Reach out if you want to learn more about that. Blessings on your path until we meet again. This is Renee LaValle McKenna for Spiritual Psychology.